Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 6 of Lippincott's biochemistry textbook. In this chapter we're going to go over bioenergetics and also oxidative phosphorylation. Before getting started I just wanted to thank everyone for subscribing. We just officially crossed over the 10,000 subscriber mark which is absolutely incredible and can't believe that that's happening. I'm glad that it's helpful for a lot of people. I love reading the comments that you drop so feel free to keep commenting if, if this is helpful and I'll try my best to keep producing these chapters for you. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please feel free to do so as it does help us out. Otherwise, let's jump straight into bioenergetics by describing what that is. So that's purely just the transfer and utilization of energy in our biological systems. So it's just a broad term and that really predicts whether a process is possible. That's different to kinetics because kinetics is just measuring the reaction rate. Now, a couple other definitions here include enthalpy and entropy. So enthalpy is just a measure of the change in heat content of the reactants and products. Whereas entropy is a measure in the change in randomness or disorder of the reactants and products. And these two factors together can describe the change in free energy. So you can see in this equation over here, change in free energy is equivalent to the change in enthalpy minus temperature in Kelvin or absolute temperature times your change in entropy. And this change in energy is really just predicting the direction that the reaction will occur. So going further into free energy, free energy can be expressed in two ways. This delta G, which just represents the change in free energy and the direction of the reaction. And this is not dependent on a certain concentration of product or reactant. Or I should say that you're going to have a change in delta G depending on the concentration of products and reactants. So delta G is a variable. It will change depending on how much product and how much reactant is available within that reaction. The other way of representing free energy is delta G zero. So we've got the superscript zero at the top here. Now this turns free energy into more of a constant by having the same reactant and products. So the reactants and product concentrations are both one mole per liter. So then you're just seeing what the delta G zero is when you have the same reactant and product. So that's almost getting like a baseline change in energy for that reaction. So if you have a negative delta G, that means you're going to have a loss of energy and the reaction will go on spontaneously. So for A going to B, you're going to have A going to B spontaneously if the delta G of this reaction is negative. If it's positive, then there's going to be a net gain of energy. Since there's a net gain of energy, you need energy to be added to the system in order for the reaction to occur. And then if the delta G is zero, that means the reaction is in equilibrium and there isn't any movement back and forth. So you can see that in this graph over here where you've got A going into B. So the delta G for A going into B, the free energy change is negative. So it's going to spontaneously occur. Now for B to go back into A, you now have to put in energy and your delta G is positive in order for it to go back to A. And this is equivalent. So the d negative delta G for A going to B is equal to the positive delta G for B going to A. So that kind of describes that down here. If it's negative five kilocal per mole, then the backward reaction is positive five kilocal per mole. So next we're gonna show how delta G changes as the concentrations of our reactants and product changes as well, using this equation down the bottom here. So you can see delta G equals our constant of delta G zero plus our gas constant times our absolute temperature times the logarithmic of our product divided by your reactant. Really the key point here is that if your reaction has a delta G zero, so the constant of that reaction is positive, so it's actually slightly harder for that reaction to occur or when the reactant and the product both have a concentration of one millimole per liter, then you're going to have to add energy to the system in order for that reaction to occur. So if that delta G zero is positive for a certain reactant, then depending on the concentrations of your reactant and product, you may still have spontaneous occurrence of that reaction.
if your product is extremely low compared to your reactant. So if you have a lot of reactants, very little product, that means that you get a large negative value here, which then actually minuses off your positive value for your delta G zero. So then your overall delta G actually becomes zero and your reaction will proceed in the forward reaction. Gives you an example of that with glucose 6-phosphate over here if you need to uh, pause and look over that point there. So really it's just saying if the product is extremely low versus the reactant, then your delta G may be negative even if your delta G zero, the constant, is positive. So that really just shows you that delta G zero represents whether or not the reaction is going to occur under standardized conditions. So when your reaction and your product is one millimoles per liter, but it does not predict the direction of the reaction under physiological conditions because the reactant and the product concentrations are actually different. Now a new term coming in here is KEQ, which just stands for the equilibrium constant. This represents the concentration of your product divided by your concentration of your reactant when they are in equilibrium, so the reaction is not going to occur. Since that reaction is not going to occur, since you're in equilibrium, our delta G is actually zero. Our free energy is zero. We talked about that just briefly before, talking about how if you have a zero delta G, the reaction is in the equilibrium. So the equilibrium constant just describes what the concentration of the product and the reactant is at that point. So because of that, you can say zero equals the delta G zero plus the RT logarithmic of your equilibrium constant. Now you can rearrange this equation to actually represent your equilibrium constant to delta G zero. This then allows some simple predictions of the following. If your equilibrium constant is one, then your delta G zero is zero. And that's because you have an equalized reaction between A to B. If your equilibrium constant is greater than one, that means your delta G is going to be less than zero, it's going to be negative because you have more of your reactant going to your product. And then vice versa, if your equilibrium constant is less than one, your delta G zero is going to be positive and you're going to have a reversal of that equation. And then lastly here, our last thing we'll talk about with delta G and delta G zero is that they are additive. So when we have a sequence of reactions, so A to B to C to D, then these are all additive. And the overall pathway determines whether it's going to all occur. So if the overall pathway is negative, then it's going to occur, even though some individual pathways may have positive delta Gs. Now those can be lowered, though the activation energy can be lowered with enzymes throughout the reaction. And you'll see that as we go through this textbook, how you have these rate limiting steps, which can be lowered with enzymes. And those positive delta Gs are also able to be overcome using a molecule called ATP, for instance. So some reactions have very large positive delta Gs, let's say the movement of ions against its concentration gradient across a membrane. We can use ATP, hydro hydrolyze it, get rid of one of those phosphate bonds, which releases a ton of energy, which then overcomes, or at least puts energy into that positive delta G to allow that reaction to occur. So next we're going to talk about the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. This is how we're able in the, in the body to convert our food substances, so glucose or carbohydrates, into energy that we can then use to move around. So why food is so important is that it gets converted into energy for movement and also the normal functioning of our body. So the way that we're able to convert these energy rich molecules into energy is by oxidative phosphorylation. And basically what happens is that glucose gets converted eventually into carbon dioxide and water. And then along the way, we produce these intermediates which get reduced. So these specific coenzymes, NAD and FAD, gets reduced down into NADH and FADH. So these intermediates are almost like carriers of electrons. They then carry the electrons from the breakdown of glucose to this electron transport chain within the mitochondria. We'll get into more details in this as well, where it then passes that electron down this little chain to then pump hydrogen ions across the membrane, which is then used to produce ATP. 
So we'll get into that in more detail, but that is the summary of it. Glucose gets converted into carbon dioxide and water. Along the way, electrons get transported by NAD and FAD, these coenzymes, to the electron transport chain within the mitochondria. So our mitochondria contains two specific membranes. So we've got this outer membrane that has a lot of special channels. It's freely permeable to a lot of molecules. There's no major issue with the transport of molecules across that outer membrane. The inner membrane, however, has a specialized role. So it is actually impermeable to most ions, including hydrogen ions, and also molecules like ATP, ADP, pyruvate, and other metabolites. So the inner membrane is specifically impermeable for the role of oxidative phosphorylation. Now in the mitochondria, it is very rich in proteins to then actually oxidize pyruvate, amino acids, fatty acids, etc., and also our Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, to then be able to produce these coenzymes that have electrons to go through the oxidative phosphorylation system. So a mitochondrial matrix has a lot of enzymes to break down and convert or oxidize the building blocks of our foodstuffs. So the basic organization of our inner mitochondrial membrane is that it contains four complexes labeled nicely, complex one, two, three, and four. And you can see that over here in figure six, eight here, we got complex one, two, three, and four. And then we have this mobile electron carrier called coenzyme Q, which is also ubiquinone. You can see that here. So coenzyme Q is able to accept and donate electrons within the inner mitochondrial membrane. And then at the end of the day, you can see that we have actually produced water from oxygen and hydrogen ions as well. So this is the entire electron transport carrier system here. You can see that we have NAD releasing its electron to complex one. We've got succinate that gets converted into fumarate, which helps to donate another electron to coenzyme Q here through complex two. So complex one uses NAD, complex two uses succinate, Correspondingly, they have the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase and NADH dehydrogenase. They donate their electrons to coenzyme Q, which then passes its electron over to cytochrome B or cytochrome C1, which then donates its electron to complex 3 or cytochrome BC1, which then passes its electron to complex 4. Now, the key point here is that this passment of electrons from complex three to four, and then eventually on to oxygen and hydrogen ions to water, energy is utilized because this little electron is losing energy as it passes down this chain. Their energy is utilized to pump hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So then you create a high hydrogen ion concentration between the outer and inner membrane of the mitochondria. So we get this highly acidic area around the kind of inner outer membrane space there, or the intermembrane space there. Because this electrons which have been gathered from complex one and two pass to coenzyme Q and then given to complex three, complex three moves four hydrogen ions and then complex four moves as two hydrogen ions across, creating this highly acidic environment in the intermembrane space. Now that final electron is then passed on to oxygen via cytochrome C oxidase, which contains some copper, but mainly knowing that electron goes to oxygen plus hydrogen creates water. And then as you can see here in this figure, this is really just in a nutshell the oxidative phosphorylation system. So we have this reduced substrate that donates its electron all the way down this various pathways. So NAD, complex one, coenzyme Q, complex three, cytochrome C, complex four, then eventually oxygen. And each movement then releases some energy, and mainly we're moving hydrogen ions across at complex three and four. There are inhibitors of the oxidative phosphorylation chain. You can see them all outlined here, which block it at certain points just by basically attaching to the cytochrome processes and just stopping them. We won't go into too much details there. So yeah, as we mentioned, hydrogen 
gets pumped out at complexes, well, three and four, and then also didn't mention, it also occurs at complex one. Now, complex two does not contribute to the hydrogen concentration. So that's a key point there out of the four complexes, it's one, three, and four that pumps hydrogen ions across the inner membrane. Now it talks briefly about the free energy released during electron transport, and this is talking about redox pairs. So redox pairs is just the equation of electron transfer. So the molecules that lose electrons are being oxidized, or there's oxidation, and then the molecule that is gaining electrons is being reduced. So obviously if we have electrons being transferred from one substance to another, one is being oxidized, one is being reduced, and that is a redox pair. Now a redox pair differs in its tendency to lose electrons, and that is represented by E0, or our standard reduction potential. So if the E0 is negative, you have a propensity to lose electrons. If your E0 is positive, then you have a tendency to gain electrons. The more negative you are, the more likely you are to donate your electrons. The more positive, the stronger you like to attract electrons and gain electrons. Now it is related to our delta G0 through this equation up here. So then it then shows you how this relates to our delta G0 of ATP. So in order to actually create ATP from ADP, there is a positive delta G0 because you have to add energy to the system to create ATP. Now, NADH, its release of electrons actually releases 52.6 kilocals of energy when we only need 7.5 kilocals to produce ATP. So we can produce at least three ATP molecules from one NADH molecule quite easily because you can see 3 times 7.3 is going to be 21.9. The difference between 52.6 and 21.9, that is then released as heat. There's always heat with every reaction that is performed and that is almost like the waste product of it, but not always as we'll get to with uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. So we've shown how the electron goes down the electron transport chain to then push hydrogen ions by complex one, three, and four into the intermembrane space. But how does that hydrogen ion concentration now create ATP? Well, that is the chemiosmotic hypothesis. So this is how you generate free energy from that transport of electrons. And it's through this proton pump. As you can see over here, we have this proton pump, which is complex five. We have an F0 domain that sits within the inner membrane. And then we have complex five, the F1 domain that sits within the matrix. So what happens is that we have all of this hydrogen ions getting pumped across from complex one, three, and four. Now they're all sitting within this intermembrane space. There is now a electrical gradient and a pH gradient driving hydrogen back into the matrix. So it's able to get driven down. Remember our inner membrane is actually impermeable to hydrogen ions. So the only way for hydrogen ions to get into the matrix is through complex five or this proton pump. And on this proton pump in the F1 domain is an ATP synthase. So the energy released from hydrogen going down its concentration gradient and also its electrical gradient is enough to produce one ATP molecule from 10 hydrogen ions. So this is how ATP synthesis through the proton pump is coupled to our electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. So you can see that electron getting transported across all the way into oxygen to create water. And then in the process, you get all this hydrogen ions within the intermembrane space down its concentration gradient in complex five or the proton pump to then produce ATP. Now this acceptance of the electron by oxygen here 
this shows you why this is oxidative phosphorylation and this is a part of aerobic respiration. This is why we need to breathe oxygen when we exercise and produce more energy because without oxygen here, we cannot accept that electron, which then stops this entire electron flow. We no longer have hydrogen ions building up here and we lo no longer produce ATP. So without oxygen, we just stop the entire electron flow, the entire electron transport chain. Now we do have uncoupling proteins, which is just a protein that sits within this inner membrane that then allows hydrogen to pass across the membrane, go into the matrix and get rid of the electrical and concentration gradient without actually producing ATP. So that's uncoupling oxidative phosphorylation and now you'd no longer produce energy. Instead, all of that energy that was created is now released as heat. So it's actually very important in infants who have a lot of what's called brown fat or brown adipocytes, which is fat that is uncoupled from oxidative phosphorylation because of these uncoupling proteins to produce a lot of heat for infants which are very small, they have a high surface area relative to their body mass, so they're more likely to lose heat. So brown fat, which is very, very prevalent in infants, not so prevalent in adults, but it's still there in small portions, they are uncoupled to produce heat only without producing ATP. There are synthetic uncouplers, so molecules which actually uncouple this without us wanting it to be uncoupled, so such as ionophores, so then you just produce a lot of heat without the production of energy. And then lastly here we're going to talk about how these substances actually get into the mitochondria in the first place. So we've talked about what happens in the mitochondria, but now we actually need ATP to leave the system and we need ADP and phosphate ions to actually get into the matrix of the mitochondria in order for it to be converted into ATP. So then it can then leave the mitochondria and go back into the cell where it's going to be used. Now, but remember this inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to a lot of substances, including ADP, PI, and also our reducing coenzyme, so NADH for instance. So what happens is that we have this ATP, ADP antiporter in the, in the membrane, which then spits out ATP and spits in ADP. So we have the specific protein to help the movement of ADP. And then when it comes to moving NADH into the membrane, we actually use these two different shuttle systems. So the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle, as you can see at the top here, and then also the malate aspartate shuttle at the bottom here. It's a pretty complex reaction to go over in minute detail, but basically the NADH gives up its electron to glycerol 3-phosphate, which then can then cross over the inner membrane, and then that electron is given over to actually FAD. So the glycerol 3-phosphate system transports electrons from NAD to FAD within the matrix. The malate aspartate shuttle, however, takes the electron from NADH, malate then transports across the inner membrane, the malate then gives up its electron to NADH again and gets converted into oxalocetate. So NADH goes off to complex one, oxalocetate then combines with glutamate, go into and gets deaminated into aspartate and alpha glutarate, which can, can pass the membrane again. It's a little bit more complex, but basically the main point here is glycerol 3-phosphate converts the electron or transports the electron across the inner membrane to FAD, and then the malate aspartate shuttle transports the electron from NAD to NAD within the mitochondrial matrix. It talks about some defects in oxidative phosphorylation which may occur in a gene either in your nuclear DNA or your mitochondrial DNA. It's much more common to occur in your mitochondrial DNA, however, and it typically shows a disorder within those areas that have the highest demand for ATP, so your central nervous system, skeletal and heart muscle and the liver. And also lastly, your mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited because your mitochondria from the sperm cell don't enter the fertilized egg.
And then lastly, mitochondria is involved with apoptosis, which is initiated through this intrinsic system or intrinsic pathway. It's just one of the pathways for apoptosis, where pores in the outer mitochondrial membrane form allow cytochrome C to leave the mitochondria into the cytosol and then activate these proteolytic enzymes called capsases that induces apoptosis. So that is the end of chapter six. I hope you enjoyed it. There is a ch chapter summary just here. Feel free to pause it there. There's also some questions on the left and then the answers. Feel free to drop a comment. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.